Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. John Hodiak in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite recreates an historical puzzle as we attempt to locate a sunken treasure. The story, based on fact, is called Gold of the Adomar. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. Why, Sheriff, you look like a dude on Saturday night. Well, I'm going for a ride in my new car. There she is over there. Well, an Autolite-equipped car, I see, with a complete Autolite electrical system, including the coil distributor, voltage regulator, starting motor, generator, spark plugs, and battery. You mean Autolite makes whole electrical systems, Harlow? They sure do, Sheriff, and every unit and every component part of the Autolite electrical system is related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. That's why Autolite electrical systems are installed as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, tractors, and boats. Well, I, I sure am lucky. Right you are, Sheriff. So, friends, be sure to insist on Autolite original service parts for the electrical system of your Autolite-equipped car, truck, tractor, or boat. You'll find it pays because, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Mr. John Hodiak in Gold of the Adomar, a story based on fact, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. You don't hear the splash when you're lowered over the side on a diving stage. Draped in 200 pounds of lead, copper, and rubberized canvas, the main concern at the moment is precarious balance between the inlet and exhaust air valves. Then you step off the diving stage, hang by your lifelines, and begin the long, slow drop to the frigid blackness of the bottom of the sea. As many times as I've done this, I've never felt free from the paralyzing fear of the deep. The ocean seems to take on a malignant personality. But this time the stakes are high. I'm dropping down to a barnacled hulk that has in its strong room three million dollars in gold. And as the light from the surface slowly fades, I relax and think. Think about the beginning of my lust for gold. without you, Nick. Thanks. Still trying to figure out why. After 14 years, you suddenly decide to leave the Navy. Tired of living underwater. But what I've you... had a couple of offers from civilian salvage outfits. Doing what? Supervising, boys. Supervising. Up top, where the sun shines. But you don't have to dive anymore if you don't want to. Be an instructor. Fred. What? Fred, it's a monetary world. If I have to live in it, I'm going to get some of it. So? So this... If I can get a civilian berth, it'll give me three times as much in the next five years as I can get here, then I'm going to do it. You'll be eligible for pension in six years. <laughs> Couldn't care less. Uh, that's it. Yep. That's it. Where will you be staying? New York for now. Write me as soon as you have an address. I will. Don't get too much of a suntan. Right now, I'd gladly take a blistering burn. <laughs> Sunburn. Someday I'll get one. Maybe after all this is over, I'll have enough of the monetary world to bask in the sun for the rest of my life. Right now, though, I'm cold. I have to swallow over and over again to clear my ears. This wasn't what I had in mind when I left the service. That is, I didn't have it in mind until Carl Foster talked to me. went to the Navy Yard hoping to talk you into getting a leave of absence. But now that you've left the service... How'd you find me here in New York? I spoke to Fred James, your ex-roommate. Oh. Why me? The country's full of competent divers. Perhaps. But I want one who's more than just competent. What's the job? Then you'll take it? Depends. On what? Equipment. Most of all, money. Well, I've got the equipment. 
And the money? How about one-fifth of three million dollars? Uh, let me tell you something, Mr. Foster. Uh, Carl. Carl. When I made my first dive into deep water, I had dreams about getting the loot from every sunken Spanish galleon that ever sailed the high seas. But I'm grown up now. If this is another treasure hunt, then it's no deal. I've done that bit. But this isn't just another treasure hunt. This is the gold that went down with the Adamar. The Adamar's never been located. It's in 24 fathoms of water. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I trust you, Nick, but I can't afford to take chances. Forget about the location for a minute. <laughs> Forgotten. What kind of shape she in? Oh, I don't know for sure. All I can tell from topside is that she seems to be resting in a gully. Not good. Any chance you might be wrong? Oh, possibly. My instruments only gave me the general condition of the wreck. Well, then you haven't been down. No, and I can't anymore. Why not? Heart. Oh. Last case of the Ben's ruined. Sorry. But uh, if you haven't been down, how can you be sure it's the Adamar? I'll tell you. As you probably know, the Adamar was en route to Morocco from here with three million dollars in bullion. Mm -hmm. The rest of the cargo had a secret loading manifest. Uh, 1910, wasn't it? Uh, 1911. Mm -hmm. She was last heard from 26 miles southeast of Nantucket Lightship. Then disappeared. Right. They've looked for her for 42 years. Well, then how can you be sure it's the Adamar you've located? A little over 20 miles southeast of the Lightship, I found a wreck. Now, I've checked records till I'm blind, and there's no known wreck of that size reported within 15 miles. That's kind of flimsy proof. I got a deal for you. Go ahead. Make one die for me. If it is the Adamar... We continue with our prearranged deal. If not, I'll pay you 500 for the dive. The deal. How soon can you get your equipment together? <laughs> we're ready to sail right now. You were pretty sure of yourself, weren't you? <laughs> to uh, answer that, I'll deliver a message from your roommate, Fred. What's that? He told me to tell you it's a monetary world. <laughs> My world is now apart from the world of normal men. My world is composed of me in the depths of the black sea. There's no sound but the hiss of the exhaust valve as it sends a long ribbon of bubbles upward. Topside in the normal world, everything's ready. Nothing is left to chance. Everything must be right. The men, the time, the place, and the equipment... Name it, and you've got it. This ship's rigged to tackle anything. Hey, you weren't kidding when you said you were ready to go. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Shall we? Anchor's away. Mr. Gordon. Aye, sir. Hoist anchor. We're on our way. Aye, aye, sir. Let's go to my cabin. Good idea. I want everything right when I go over the side. In here. Thanks. Your uh, gear stowed away? All secured. Fine, fine. Now, here's the, the layout of the Adamar. Where's the strong room? Uh, it's right, right here. Three decks down. <laughs> I thought you'd feel that way. Well, it's not a problem, really. In a flexible rig at 24 fathoms, I can go right down the stairs from the superstructure to that room, then torch my way in. If the hull is upright. You think it isn't? I can't be sure. Instruments registered smooth surface fore and aft. I think she's on her side in the gully. There uh, weren't any survivors, were there? No. On the night she sank, a CQD was picked up, but before recognition was given, it was gone. Maybe we'll find out how she went down. Maybe. But remember, we only have a week. Anyway, if she's on her side, here's what we have uh, to do. Wait a minute. You said you only had a week. Why only a week? Well, before I located this, I'd already contracted to go to South America for five years to do a series of salvage jobs. I don't want to take the chance of somebody else finding the Adamar while I'm gone. Well, isn't the bullion worth more than the contract? Well, it is, if it's there. I've seen empty strong rooms before. Well, you want to get in, get the loot, if it's there, and get out, is that it? On the button. Ergo, blasting instead of torching. Blasting, huh? What about the rest of the cargo? No one seems to be able to get a hold of a copy of the manifest. Now, we may find something interesting when we get the hull opened up. Ah, <laughs> yes, we may. Well, here we go. Yep, here we go. <laughs> and I didn't even get a sunburn. <laughs> <laughs> 
Huh? What was that? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. I no longer look upward. The land of my world is about to come to me from beneath. I turn my lamp on again and flash it downward. And there, seeming to rise up from the dark of nothing, is a ship. And I'm no longer alone. Here is something from my other world. Here is something which was touched by men who felt the warmth of sunlight. Here at my feet could be the wreck of the Atomar. On the bottom... Bullseye. I'm on the hull. How do you feel? Fine. Now, Nick, tell me everything you see and what you're doing. Right. I think I'm pretty close to midships. You were right. She's on her side. Uh huh. Now, remember, you've only got an hour. I'm going to check the boat deck for a nameplate. Okay, but be careful. Yeah. Top side. Here. You won't have to pay me for the dive. It's the Atomar? That's what it says here. Oh, ho, ho. start counting your money. I've spent it already. Hey, what's the layout, huh? From where I am, the beam of my lamp just barely reaches to the sides of the gully you mentioned. They're about 20 feet higher than the hull, as it lies now. Uh, what kind of bottom do you have? Can't say for sure. But it doesn't look like sand. Probably mud. Watch your footing. Okay. We're going over to... What, what's the matter up there? Ah, uh, little chop sprung up. We're, we're pitching a bit. Give me more line. Oh, on its way. I'm near a side entry port. Can't make out the number. Let me check. You're on the starboard side, you say. That, uh, that should make it the one next to the purser's office. Where's the strong room from where I am? About, uh... 20 feet aft of you. I'll check. Carl? Yeah, go ahead, Nick. I know how the Atomar was sunk. What's that? There's a hole amidships big enough to drive a truck through. Well, can you make out any detail? The plates are bent inward. Looks like a mine or a torpedo. Hmm. Nothing we can do about that now. Are you near the strong room yet? Heading for it right now. Got to get around this hole. You want us to lift you over? No. I'll find foothold on the rivet. Porthole. Top side. Carl. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Slipping. No foothold. Take up the slack. Take it up. Hey, haul away, Gordon. Haul away. Carl. Your lines are taut. Can't budge them. Slack off. Nick. The bottom's mud, all right. I'm in it over my head. Lost my lamp. Can't see a thing. Look, Nick, we're, we're going to pull three times on your line. Let us know if you feel it. Go ahead. I said go ahead. We, we did. Didn't you feel it? No. We'll pull a little harder. Slack off. Slack off. My lines are fouled. Are you sure? I think they're fouled on one of the bent plates in the hull. What are you going to do? I don't know. I don't think I'm ready to die. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Hodiak with Joseph Kearns in Gold of the Atomar. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense. Uh, see, uh, Harlow, uh, how long's Autolite been making them automotive electrical systems? Why, Sheriff, since way back in 1911, when Autolite developed the first two-unit, six-volt electrical system used as original equipment. All that time? Yes, Sheriff, and the Autolite electrical system has a big job to do. It goes to work when you start your car and works every second the engine does, as well as when you blow your horn, turn on your heater, radio, or lights. Well, now that auto light electrical system's pretty good, Harlow. It's the finest money can buy, Sheriff. And because the electrical system is so important to smooth economical operation of your car, 
it should be treated to a periodic checkup by your car dealer or authorized Autolite service station. To quickly locate him, look in the classified section of the phone book under Automobile Electrical Service or call Western Union and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. John Hodiak in Elliot Lewis's production of Gold of the Atomar, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. There isn't much use in struggling. The 200 pounds of my diving rig pull me deeper into mud which is already over my head. But the dark is the worst. It's the dark that terrifies me. Because it isn't water dark. It's mud dark. I can't find a foothold in this sea of gelatinous muck. Nothing. Nick. Nick. Suddenly, Can you hear me? I'm aware of Carl's voice intruding. Nick. A welcome intrusion because Nick. it's a voice in the world I so desperately wish I was in. Nick. Nick, can you hear me? Are you okay? Yeah, Carl. Up to now, I'm okay. Oh, we've uh, taken up all the slack. Don't try any harder. If my line is fouled on a hull plate, it might tear my air hose. We know. The important thing is to get you out of the mud. Important to who? Me? Brother, three million bucks. Now, now, easy, Nick. Sorry. Are your hands free? No. My left hand is pressed against my side. My right's across my chest. Can you can you move your legs? Not much. Even if I could, it wouldn't do any good. No solid footing here. Uh, Nick. Yeah. Want me to come down and get you? Want to die? We've got to do something. I know. Top side. All right here, Nick. I'm going to try something. My right hand's near enough to my inlet valve to turn it full on. No, you'll balloon. Right. Maybe I'll get enough buoyancy to drag myself out of this muck. If you pop through too fast, you'll surface. Or you'll be dead before we can get to you. I think I can get into the inlet valve fast enough to cut my air down. And let it bleed out slowly so I can stay down. Then I'll get my lines free and you can haul me up. Ready the decompression chamber just in case I miss. No, 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 no. It's too risky. Don't do it. Got a better idea? No. Then we'll do it my way. I'm no hero. But it's the only way out of the mud. Ballooning my rig could kill me. If I don't shut off my air in time, I'll shoot up to the surface. Then if I miss braining myself on the hull of the salvage ship, I'll pop through the surface and be dead of the bends before Carl gets to me. But I have to risk it. I don't want to die in the dark of the mud. Slowly, I inch my hand up to my breastplate and twist the handle of the inlet valve. As my rig inflates, I feel the pressure of the mud ease off. A little more. A little more. Suddenly, I pull free and shoot up toward the surface. I claw for the air valve and turn it off, but still I rise. Desperately, I bang my exhaust valve wide open with my chin. Too late. I'm too buoyant. Suddenly, I'm brought up short. My fouled lifeline holds firm. As the excess air bleeds through the exhaust valve, I settle back to the Atomar. To another chance at three million dollars. I adjust the balance of the valves and look for the spot where my line fouled. I find it. Have some more coffee. Thanks. <laughs> oh, man. That air smells good. Well, I guess that's that. What do you mean? That's that. Well, you're not going down there anymore, are you? Of course I am. I'm a diver, not a tourist. Well, that was a pretty rough go down there. Yes, it was. But there's also $3 million down there. I'm not going to let a little mud bother me. <laughs> funny. What's funny? You calling it only a little mud... Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess so. Well, 
Now that you're going ahead, what's the next step? Blast. When? Tomorrow morning. How many charges do you think it'll take? About three. The one thing bothers me... What's that? Well, that gully the Adamer's in. Any uh, chance of the sides caving in from the blast? I thought about that, too. I don't think so, Carl. I'm going to use control charges. Most of the blast effect will channel into the plate. Mm. Okay. Why don't you turn in now? It's been a rough day. I think I will. What about you? Uh, well, in a few minutes. Okay. Good night. Night, man. Nightmares about mud. All night long, I dreamed of sticky, gummy, slimy mud. Until it seemed that the whole world was one gigantic mud ball. Finally, I managed to get a few hours of restful sleep. Dreamless sleep. Welcome sleep. In the morning, I climbed into my rig and went down to set the first blast on the Atomar. The water was clear, and my lamp pierced through to the limit of its beam. I planted the charge against the entry port and went up to the salvage ship to help Carl with the detonation. We made the necessary arrangements and pulled the trigger. The next day was a repetition of the previous day. Six hours after the second blast, I went down to check the results. How'd we do? Knocked off a little more than I expected. Cargo hold is exposed. Looks like there was only one bulkhead between it and the strong room. I'm going to check it. Okay, but don't take any chances. Relax. That gold is as good as a board right now. Topside. Yeah, go ahead. I know why the cargo manifest was secret. What'd you find? Dynamite. <laughs> Why didn't the Atomar blow up when she was hit? The hole in her hull is aft the munitions hole. Mm. Any one of a dozen things could have diverted the shock. Oh, but a main hold full of munitions and dynamite. It's no surprise to me. A cargo hold full of munitions isn't a surprise? Under ordinary conditions, yes. But under the conditions surrounding the voyage of the Atomar, no. All right, I'll bite. What were the conditions? Well, first we know that she sailed in 1911, July 2nd. Yeah, well, what's that? I'm, I'm coming to that. On July 1st. A German warship, the Panther, sailed into the harbor of Agadir, port of Morocco. I think I'm beginning to get the story. This was the incident that almost caused a war between France and Germany. On the butt. Well, then the reason the Atomar was on its way to Morocco was to deliver the essentials of war, money and munitions. That's the way I got it figured. Well, now the secret manifest begins to make sense. Doesn't it, though? What do we do now? That's your job. One more blast. Are you nuts? The next blast might set off all the munitions. No, it wouldn't. Nick, that stuff's been underwater for over 40 years. Why, there wouldn't be one chance in a million of that happening. It happened once before. When? 1930, the Artilio in the harbor of Tiburona. Oh, yeah, but the TNT in the hold of that wreck had only been underwater 13 years. 1333 makes no difference. But there is a difference. That other stuff was only in 10 fathoms. It's 24 fathoms here. There's enough pressure down there to squash every shell, let alone seep into every crack. All right. What do you want to do? Blast. Even if it means planting two small charges and two separate trips, it'll still be faster than an underwater torch. Supposing the whole wreck blows. Well, then you lose one-fifth of three million bucks. And you? I go back to South America. Well? Okay. Hate me. I'm greedy. Let's go. All set? All set. I set the explosive fore and aft. Oh, good. One thing. Yeah, what? 
How much electrical cable you got? Oh, a couple of thousand feet wide. Let's use it. We've got the buoy for a marker. Let's ease off as far as we can from the wreck, just in case the cargo goes. Nothing's going to happen. I said let's move off. This is my ship, and I give the orders. We stay. Aye, aye, sir. Gordon. Aye, sir. Make ready to blast. Ready. Let her go. Here she goes. salvage ship sprung every seam in her hull. Most of the gear was washed overboard as great gobs of mud spewed from the bottom, rose into the air, and splashed against us. Wasn't hard to imagine what happened on the bottom. The gully that cradled the Atomar collapsed. The sides rolled down on the wreck, bearing it under 20 feet of silt. What happened to the three million dollars is anybody's guess. Probably salted through all the muck 24 fathoms down. We managed to make it to dry dock for repairs. I never saw Carl again after that. Me? Well, if you want me, you'll have to write to Chief Petty Officer Larkin, attached to undersea training, New London, Connecticut. I'm eating three good meals a day, getting plenty of sunshine, and building up pension time. I think I'm content. As far as I'm concerned, you can have your monetary world. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. John Hodiak. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why during the early months of this year, as we did a year ago, the Autolite family will join in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family is a worldwide family and includes some 30,000 men and women in Autolite plants in the United States, Canada, and many foreign countries, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as thousands of Autolite distributors and dealers and the many leading manufacturers who use Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family will salute the Hudson Motor Car Company on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense on television so that you'll be sure to see this program. Next week, a true story with only names and places changed. A classic report on a famous bank robbery and murder in the Old West. It's called The Spencer Brothers. Our star, Mr. Richard Widmark. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Luskin. Gold of the Adomar was written for Suspense by Ross Murray. In tonight's story, Joseph Kearns was heard as Carl, Clayton Post as Fred, and Charles Calvert as Gordon. John Hodiak is soon to be seen in Conquest of Cochise, a Columbia picture. And remember, next week, Mr. Richard Whitmark in The Spencer Brothers. This is the CBS Radio Network.